Well, class, now we are going to begin studying the Baroque era. This is Unit 3 in our class, and it's going to be a much longer unit than the Renaissance and Medieval era. And it's a pretty large scope of learning. And so this is a short introduction to Baroque art and music. It may have some overlap of some of the others chapters, but these are some of the major terms that you're going to be dealing with and uh, and some of the Baroque aesthetic that we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. The Baroque era generally is described as having begun in 1600 and it was over by 1750. There was a flamboyant style in the Baroque aesthetic, colossal proportions, abundant decoration, a lot of energy both in the music and in the artwork, and dramatic contrast. So looking at these three examples of Baroque art, uh, I wonder if I actually, okay, it says that this art is from around 1610. Uh, I can't remember if this is done by Caravaggio or by Artemisia Genaleschi, who happens to be a woman artist but it's certainly in that style because both of their um, paintings reflect a very strong contrast between light and dark. So you can see the dark background. There's often a dark background to their paintings. And then very bright contrast here of the angel's wings and uh, the porcelain effect of the uh, skin on, on the woman with the lute. Uh, also, you can see like a shine to her dress, but also very black color to the dress. And the forms are very solid, but they, they keep your eye moving in different directions. Your eye goes up here because of the, looks. I think it's a double bass or cello. Uh, the lute kind of shoots your eyes out this way the wingspan of the angel and then the figures in the drawing. It's, it's got a general triangle which is considered to be very good composition but uh, also a lot of movement when you view a painting like this. Now the second painting which is uh, I believe this is the god Poseidon and he has his trident. Uh, we can see a lot of decoration that really is somewhat detracting from the subject of the of the painting which is the interaction between the god Poseidon and uh, the woman here. It could be Athena, it could be the goddess of love, I cannot remember. But but we have a lot of almost silliness going on. We have the cherub splashing around here in the water. Uh, we have an angel up on top. Uh, it looks like photobombing the painting lots of greenery and fruit kind of decorating and it uh, looks like a wild lion there uh, and then perhaps one of Poseidon's attendants has a conch shell that he's blowing and uh, you know even the drapery around Poseidon's uh, midsection is uh, you could almost hear the rustling of the fabric and, and see that it's it's in movement and uh, so there's very much a typical Baroque painting. And then the third one here, which uh, is um, a, a religious painting, we can see uh, an angel appearing and the man who is being spoken to is, uh, is shying away from, from the bright light and there's a lot of emotion in his face. Architecture, wow, look at these <laughs> photos. <laughs> uh, everything is constructed on a grand scale. You can see in the upper picture this is Versailles Palace in Paris, France, or near Paris, France. And uh, this is a formal garden, and the formal gardens of the Baroque and Versailles gardens are still held up today as being some of the most elaborate gardens ever made. 
and at least a portion of this garden is still maintained uh, and that, that is the look of the garden today. Also, the palace itself has been maintained and has become a museum. This is um, the Hall of Mirrors, I believe, and everything in this palace is opulent. Uh, here's a bed. <laughs> Even the beds are colossal. Over here we have St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the epicenter of the heart of the Catholic Church in the Vatican. And we can see here, this is actually huge. You'll um, get a chance to see it. This is the high altar. And you'll have a chance to see uh, a photo of that in MindTap in your textbook. It's very elaborate. And uh, you see the coffered ceiling here and all of the detail, the details on the archways, now rounded archways. Since the, the um, Renaissance, the archways are now rounded. Uh, the floor is elaborately decorated. Everything has a, a richness and an opulence to it, as well as a grand scale. Here are two paintings that, uh, that I want you to think about. One is a portrait, the girl with the pearl earring, Johannes Vermeer. It was done around 1665. It's a fairly simple painting, but it's rendered much more dramatic by the black background and the strong contrast between the different colors. Uh, both of these paintings have a, a, a rich blue to them, and uh, making these pigments was, was not a trivial task and it was rather expensive to make certain colors and uh, the lapis lazuli that was required to make these blues was quite precious and expensive and would have to be crushed up into a powder and uh, this pigment would then be mixed with the various oils to create the paint. It's a, a very beautiful and simple portrait. On the other hand we have Artemisia Genelleschi's uh, violent painting of Judith beheading Holofernes. And you can see with these uh, ladies, if you would cover up the subject matter of, of this gruesome murder that they are committing, you, would, you could uh, imagine them doing something like kneading bread or perhaps cooking or, or getting ready to sew something because the expressions on their face are rather resolute and placid and don't reflect the horror of the actual subject matter of the painting. So again we have large contrast. Uh, Artemisia is a brilliant woman and um, one of the rare women to make a living in art in this this era, although it was not without a cost to her. And she actually was betrayed by one of her father's associates and raped by him. And so she had a bit of baggage around men and she uh, she actually took the man to court and she lost her case, which would have been expected back then. However, she received a lot more respect out of uh, having, having the energy and the resolve to actually try to bring the man to justice. So now let's talk about some characteristics of Baroque music. There's a remarkable variety of musical style and even between the beginning of the Baroque era to the end, the style does evolve. And we have the introduction of many new musical genres. The reason why we fix the date of the Baroque around 1600 is it's a nice round number, but also this was around the time when opera was invented in the West. So opera, cantata, oratorio, sonata, concerto, and suite, all of these are new musical genres that were uh, created in the Baroque era. There are two elements that remain constant throughout this era, an expressive and sometimes extravagant melody and a strong supporting bass. And by bass, I mean bass line, bass underpinning. It's not always an actual base. So let's compare a little bit the style of the Renaissance and the Baroque. This is vastly oversimplified, but we can see that in the Renaissance there was a direct, uncomplicated 
structure of lines for voices and instruments alike. In the Baroque era, we have two distinct styles. We have dramatic, virtuosic vocal melody and a mechanical character of instrumental music that just kind of uh, chugs along like a machine almost. There are irregular phrase lengths and more exciting and interesting music than what we heard in the Renaissance era. Now this strong bass we're talking about has a, a name. It's called the basso continuo. And this structure for the bass line remained constant throughout the era. The purpose was to establish a strong bass line over which uh, this nice foundation could, uh, could be very solid for elaborate melodies and so forth on the top. And it ensures a purposeful chord structure and, and chord progressions. Basso Continuo requires two instrumentalists. A keyboard instrument plays the chord progression, while a sustaining instrument such as the cello or the bassoon plays the bass line. And Sometimes there are some other combinations. Sometimes we'll have a guitar or a lute instead of a keyboard instrument. But uh, almost always a sustaining instrument is a cello or bassoon, although it could be a bass. So basso continuo equals two people, just to can't uh, emphasize that overly much. Here is a harpsichord, or it could be an ar organ or guitar. Actually, I didn't mention organ and then the cello or bassoon or the bass. Take a look at that harpsichord. Can you believe it? Even the legs of it have rich carvings on them and there's a painting on the interior lid of the harpsichord. It really exemplifies the Baroque era. Now here's a, an important structure in melody in the Baroque era, the melodic sequence. This is a repetition of motives at a higher or lower degree. This first appears in Baroque music and it continues as a standard melodic procedure even to today. Um, so this is a little segment from Handel's Messiah and I am not a very good singer but I'm just going to start here. This is a long melisma and uh, they're singing shall be a so So you can hear this line being repeated, but it's um, each time it's repeated a little bit higher. And it can also be repeated a little bit lower. The harmonic style of the Baroque era in the early part of the era is a chordal harmony, supporting the melody, it's tightly bound to the basso continuo, the tonality is distilled now to major and minor keys. We sort of had some uh, modes that didn't necessarily fit quite with major or minor in the Renaissance, but now we're really just using the correct half and whole steps to create major and minor keys now. The harmonies sound completely familiar to our modern ears for the first time in music history, and this really occurs during the Baroque era. The rhythmic style, there's a uniform character or mood for each section of a work. So a suite, S-U-I-T-E, like was mentioned earlier, might have six or seven or eight different parts. Each part has a character or mood and often a different tempo, a different meter, and so there's a lot of contrast with the rhythmic style. But we keep one uniform character or mood for each section. There's a driving beat, there are propulsive rhythms, so there's a lot of energy in this music. Early Baroque color becomes enormously varied. We have traditional instruments perfected, like the violin family, new combinations of instruments are being explored, and the orchestra begins to take shape. Uh, we also have the use of terraced dynamics, and a terrace dynamic would be uh, much like a terrace in a garden where you would have maybe piano and then it jumps up a level and 
we're up to forte. And maybe then it jumps down a level to mezzo forte. And then it jumps up a couple of letters to the loudest you could play, fortissimo. And so terrace dynamics are sort of sudden changes, like quickly turning the volume up or down on a device you would listen to music with. Early Baroque texture, it's predominantly homophonic because we have this strong underpinning of the bass line and then this melody that is active and using sequences and so forth. And so the basso continuo is supporting the melody and then the other parts might fill in the middle and harmonize with that melody. So Baroque texture in the early part of the Baroque era is mostly homophonic texture. The form, we have the basso ostinato common, and ostinato is when we have a repeated figure in the bass line. The ritornello form emerges, and we have the binary form for sonata and orchestral suite. Again, I'm just throwing out some new terms that you may not be familiar at all with uh, so far, but we will break these down uh, in later videos and in your chapter readings. So the basso ostinato would be used in instrumental works as well as vocal works. It might be used in an aria in an opera. And um, a simple bas basso ostinato could sound like this, but lower, of course. I'm, I don't have a deep voice. Da -di -da 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 -di da 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 uh, I can't quite get to the lower note. Da -di -da -da. So that ostinato repeated line would go on for the entire aria. So that's why we call it an ostinato. It's repeated for a long time. The ritornello form is used for concertos, pieces that feature an instrument or a group of instruments within the orchestra. And that's it. So that's the beginning of our journey through the Baroque era. And uh, there's another chapter to listen to this week and read about. It's actually in the same chapter. There's another uh, slideshow. Thank you very much.